Well, thank you so much, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I have a little bit of viral pharyngitis right now that is keeping me at home today. Um, so yeah, I am here to talk about big efforts from a little state investigating PFAS in New Hampshire. I am a toxicologist with the state of New Hampshire. So my presentation is gonna come a little bit from that perspective of a regulatory scientist. But I wanted to start out by thanking the conference organizers and those that put this together over the last several months to organize this. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here to talk as a keynote speaker. And that especially comes from the fact that actually during my doctoral program, I would come and present at this conference on my work that I was doing on pesticides in the Midwest. So it's really neat to have that opportunity to kind of go through my evolution professionally and come to the point now where I'm here as a keynote speaker to present. So I wanted to start out with acknowledgments and the sad little pun that we have in our department that there is no I in DES, and that's because we are not Iowa, Illinois, or Indiana. But I just wanted to thank all the amazing staff that I work with. So a lot of the work I'm gonna talk about today is either done in partnership with other technical staff from different programs, or is done in response to new things that I learn about our regulatory policies, how things are addressed in state, how cleanup works, from all the experienced staff that I work with in my own department. Um, there's also our partners at our sister agency within the state, Department of Public Health Services, who do a lot of blood work, monitoring work, biomonitoring work, things like that. And then also a lot of our university and college partners. Um, so I have some of them listed here, but there's a lot more that we work with, including various NGO groups, community advocacy groups, our state legislatures, and those that really motivate us to do our work. So it's really important just to acknowledge all those groups and their interests and their support is what helps us in our mission. So instead of starting out with a definition of what PFAS are, I'm going to assume that everyone has had sort of enough of that over the last 24 hours of PFAS are. I think we could all appreciate that they are persistent and mobile in the environment. They can be bioaccumulative in people and wildlife. And most importantly, they present health risk after prolonged exposure. Now, one of the things that we often point to is this great diagram from Elsie Sunderland's group that did a review back in 2019 that really tried to diagram you know, how people are being exposed, what are the general ways that PFAS move from industry through these different compartments and ultimately result in human exposure. And this is sort of a diagram that I've seen time and time again in presentations, and I think it's really helpful and it's great. It highlights how we basically can bin these large groups of where PFAS go and where they might be coming from. But from my own work here in New Hampshire, and I think many of you have probably had similar experiences, the more you talk with different groups, whether it's groups that are coming from a community perspective, if they are folks from the regulated entities, or if they're waste infrastructure management groups, even municipalities, towns, you can start understanding where you know, some of these arrows can really be broken down, become more complex, and how in some cases, some of these arrows might push back and forth against each other. And I think this is just one of the things to be mindful of is you know, when we look at this sort of big picture, these diagrams, these models that we develop are helpful. But it's also really important to realize at local scales, we might be seeing some unique things happening. Now, preceding this 2019 paper, New Hampshire had already been dealing with PFAS for a while. And that started with the discovery of PFAS, specifically PFOS and certain fluorotelomers and sulfonic acids out at the Pease Trade Port. So the map or the aerial photograph above shows the Peace Trade Port. It's a former Air National Guard base. You can see the runway there. And what happened was this has been converted into a business park. And in 2014, in the spring, there was sampling done. And at the time, they were just doing sort of this exploratory analysis to see what there was. And they detected these PFAS compounds above the interim health advisory levels that were available at the time, which were up in the hundreds of parts per trillion. So the total amount was probably in the thousands of parts per trillion for various PFAS detected in the water. Um, and it was likely due to aqueous film forming foam that was detected and used out there by the Air National Guard for several years. 
So this trade park had a lot of folks that were exposed during their day-to-day -day work. You know, you go out to the trade park, you go to your office building, you go out to the bubbler, you get a drink of water, but there's also a child care center there. And after this was discovered, there was a group that wanted to pursue PFAS blood testing. The state was able to provide a limited amount of that based on resources. But this is really what sort of got a lot of our investigation in New Hampshire going, was this discovery all the way back in 2014, which is almost a decade ago. So this is a common story with a lot of other states where AFFF has been identified as a key source of PFAS for certain communities. And even going on now, we're starting to find that some local fire departments that had a triple F for various uses have also impacted their groundwater supply. Now, after that discovery, the state started looking around trying to figure out where else we might have PFAS. And one of the major areas we found was in Southern New Hampshire near Merrimack area, where there's industrial facility that had detected high levels of PFOA in their onsite wells and what happened was this is a textile coating facility. So it was not a manufacturer of PFAS, but it was a manufacturer that used PFAS products. And essentially they would coat textiles in various treatments. PFAS is used as one of those surfactant materials. And what would happen is as they would dry these fabrics and textiles that would emit out and then it would rain down and you would get this air emissions to soil that eventually would percolate down into the groundwater. So it's likely been going on for somewhere between around 20-ish or so years. So after detecting PFOA in their own wells, it was detected in surrounding private wells as well as public water supply wells. And if you look at this map, you'll see a couple of things. So if you see red dots on there, that is above the EPA's health advisory of 70 parts per trillion, which may or may not be changing here. I know we have an interim advisory that is below detection level right now. But then if it's an orange dot, then it is above our AGQS or our own state MCLs, because New Hampshire has its own MCLs currently, even though the EPA has not finalized MCLs. And our MCL is for 12 parts per trillion. And then everything in green is below 12 parts per trillion. So what you're seeing here is there's almost a five town area that has been impacted, and it actually goes out a little bit wider than this. Now, what's interesting about this is the more we dig down in some of these spots that you see the red and the orange, it's really clustered within this red shaded area. And this is a consent decree with that manufacturer that we were confident was responsible for everything within this area. So a consent decree is a legal agreement. This is specific between the state of New Hampshire and the manufacturer. It did not take away anyone's rights in these communities to seek their own legal action with that manufacturer for impacts to their well water, their property or anything else. But this is basically our way of sort of getting the ball rolling on trying to get some management going on from the state level. But you'll see outside of that red shaded area, there are still impacted sites. And you know, this is several tens of miles wide area across several towns. And in some of these, it is very likely that it is related to that manufacturer and the air emissions over several years. But as we also start looking around, we see some hot pocket areas that may actually be due to local sources. And this is one of the things we started learning about as we broadened our investigation in 2016 and we realized, oh my God, these could be in a lot of manufacturing processes. So we started learning about other textile coating facilities in the state, current and former landfills, various Superfund sites. Um, and again, just sort of be clear and technical about this, you know, with Superfund sites, very depending on their usage, probably do have some level of PFAS present. In New Hampshire, we have a lot of older Superfund sites that are pretty well managed, but that may not be the case for other states. But we have detected PFAS in several of these. Um, metal plating facilities, which have been discussed in other presentations at this conference, certain electronic and medical device manufacturing, septic waste management. You know, a lot of our state is on septic systems and private wells, and when PFAS leave our body, they have to go somewhere. So there's also wastewater effluent, compost producers, and then a whole slew of small businesses that very likely are sources of PFAS. And again, this is not a comprehensive list. This is an evolving list of sources and conveyors. 
And I think this is an important risk communication point to make is when we're talking about these with the public, we try to be clear when we're really thinking of something as a source versus a conveyor. So for those that have done a lot of work with wastewater plants, you know, wastewater facilities are really nervous about this and they may be apprehensive about collaborating or partnering with you if you are specifically referring to them as a source because they don't actually generate PFAS themselves. They're conveying the PFAS waste that we as communities send to them. So it can sort of create a tense situation that may make them apprehensive to collaborate on research or on partnerships and again, it's just that slight change of language to acknowledge that you know they're in a tough position because they're not using PFAS as a part of the process. They're not intending to release PFAS. It's just a matter of the infrastructure isn't designed to handle that and they have a demand to meet. They need to receive our waste. Now in New Hampshire, we really like our legislation. We are very active in the democratic process. Um, for those of you that don't know, our State House of Representatives has 400 reps in it. That is 400 representatives for a population of less than one and a half million. Um, and every two years, everyone from governor to dog catcher gets to rerun for their office. So current events tend to be main focus in legislative actions. So back in 2018, we received legislation that directed us and basically allowed us to set our own maximum contaminant levels in the state. So in New Hampshire, that also applies as our ambient groundwater quality standards. And I realized for some folks that may be a very dry, boring regulatory term, but it's an important distinction because maximum contaminant levels apply to public water systems. So if someone in New Hampshire is paying a water bill for water that is coming from a treatment plant, MCLs apply to them. But if someone's on a private well, they're not required to meet any standard. But these ambient groundwater quality standards are essentially a tool that we use that if someone's well is contaminated or impacted by a nearby source and it's above this standard, it allows them to take some action. So when we initially proposed these, they were challenged in court, not based on the science, but more based on the cost benefit analysis. And as a result, our legislature codified these into laws and active legislation. So uh, effective in 2020, we had MCLs for the state of New Hampshire for four PFAS. They also wanted a plan and budget for how we might set surface water standards for PFAS, um, looked into an AFFF take back program because we have a lot of communities that their local fire department uses AFFF. So trying to figure out how to get this out of those communities and create a program that we know we can safely send it somewhere without it ending up in an inappropriate place like a landfill. We also are kind of unique. We're probably the only state that I'm aware of that has legislation that has required the coverage of PFAS blood testing by health insurance companies. It is specific to New Hampshire based health insurance companies because we, as New Hampshire, we cannot pass a law for a Connecticut health insurance company, but it is a start. So we at least have a certain degree of coverage for that. Um, they actually have a whole memo that was put out. It's a public facing document from our insurance department. If anyone is interested in that, please shoot me a message. I can send you that document. But I think most importantly, and relative to the rest of the presentation, was our legislature appropriated about $6 million for PFAS-related investigation and research activities. And for a small state like us, that is a very large chunk of money to put towards a problem like an emerging contaminant. So this is funding that was given to our department so we could figure out how to look into this issue. And I'm gonna talk about some of the ways we've applied that money over the last couple of years. So one of those approaches was to go out and sample and understand the occurrence of this, the scope of this problem. So if you look at this map over here, all the green dots again are below our AGQS or MCLs for four different PFAS compounds that we regulate. If it is an orange, then it is above that standard. And if it's a red, it's essentially above 70 for PFOA and PFOS combined. So as you see, when we start looking out across the state, we get a couple of hits in the more rural parts. But as you get closer to our Southern populations, it really starts to light up. So the really distinct blob down there is that area around that um, air emissions facility that I mentioned before. 
That's also where we have the greatest concentration of our population and a lot of our town centers. And as you go out towards the seacoast, we have another couple of spots. And some of that is related to either some towns with AFFF usage or some legacy sites or some other quirky spots that we found for PFAS sources. Um, this map is actually online and it's an interactive map. So you can either wait for me to upload the presentation into Whova for people to access, or if you just Google NHDES PFAS map, this will come up and you can look around and see how close results are. So again, private wells are not regulated like public water systems. We cannot compel people to test or treat, um, especially in the live free or die state, the notion of the state government agent coming to your door and saying, I want to test your well and tell you what to do with it may not be received very well. However, we've actually made this into a free testing program that we'll discuss a little bit more. But when we actually look at these private well results, currently we have close to over 3,900 private wells exceed at least one of our PFAS standards. But if the EPA's proposed MCL of four parts per trillion for either PFOA or PFOS is finalized, which we would then adopt as our own state standard, we're looking at over 7,500 private wells in the state would end up exceeding that. And this map would look very different. So as far as these drinking water private well users, many private well owners do not test. This is a real challenge for rural states like New Hampshire, where almost 47% of our residents are on private wells. So again, that's almost 47% of our just shy of one and a half million residents use private drinking water wells as their source of water. So many of these people do not routinely test. Of those that have even tested, most of them have never even heard of PFAS or thought that it could be in their well. So what we use some of that money for is we have our own sampling team. It's, they're a great busy bunch. I love talking with them and hearing their stories about going out to folks' homes. But they've been going out and testing people's wells for free for PFAS. So for those of you that don't know, the cost of testing for PFAS, especially the whole suite of about 30 or so that we can analyze right now at most standard labs, that's a cost of somewhere between four to $500 a pop. And for a lot of these residents that maybe are lower income or just don't have the resources to do that testing, this is really helpful. So we've been testing private well homes as well as small childcare centers because we know a lot of people run childcare centers out of their house or are particularly concerned about the effects of PFAS on children. But since we're already there, we're kind of figuring why not do double duty? And we've also been offering analysis for standard well water contaminants. So a lot of naturally occurring things that we're worried about in New Hampshire, like arsenic, uranium, radon, which are very common in the granite state, but also looking at things like VOCs and a large suite of those VOCs, because we also know that people have quirky land use histories to their property. So if we can test for multiple of these, then if people test high for PFAS or any one of these, the more information they have, the more appropriately they can treat for everything. So we actually have a tool, um, it's called our Be Well Informed app. Several other states have actually picked this up and made their own versions of it. And it's an app where you can put in well water results and it'll recommend what the appropriate treatment technology is to treat your well when you account for other things that might muck with the treatment. So for example, if you have high iron or if you have high radon levels, that might affect how much life you're gonna get out of a carbon filtration system. So again, it's a really helpful tool because it's trying to help people think about not just testing, but here's what you can do about it because not everyone is a well water engineer. And the idea of trying to figure out the right technology to treat for this can be overwhelming. And most importantly, it's expensive, right? It's not free to put on treatment to your private well. So one of the other things we've been able to use some of this money for is a PFAS rebate program where if people exceed any of our PFAS standards and they're on a private well, then we have a very large amount of money that was appropriated by our legislature to help them. So that can be either upwards of $5,000 for treatment installation, which could be a point of use, like an under the sink filter, or point of entry, which is something that treats all the water coming into the home. So we offer that, or if people just want to simply get connected to public water and not have to think about maintaining that treatment, 
if it is feasible and they're an area where water lines exist, we're providing upwards of $10,000 just to connect them to public water. So this is something that either the property owner or a tenant or installation specialist can apply for. Because again, in some cases, you know, property owner may not be interested in pursuing this for tenants. And in New Hampshire, we have a lot of local control where at the state level, we can't really compel a property owner to provide treatment to tenants. Oftentimes that's dictated by town ordinances. So by giving this option, it's something that if a tenant wants to pursue this, even if their property owner doesn't, they can at least pursue the funding and get that support if they want to. So again, it is this, this thing of trying to think beyond simply testing an occurrence, but what will you have people do with that information? Can you show them what technologies work to treat for this? And can we try to find ways to provide resources to help them out? Because oftentimes people can be very overwhelmed by this on top of everything else that they're trying to balance in their lives. Um, if you want more information about this program, some of the considerations that went behind it, how we figure out eligibility, cost, and some other kind of interesting issues about sort of equity and how do we think about income brackets and these other environmental problems, you can reach out to Amy Russo. She helps to manage this program. She can explain to you more about how that legislation worked and what it looked like working with our legislatures to figure this out. But what about other impacts to groundwater? Um, so this is my shameless plug for the work of a colleague who I believe is actually listening in today. So if anybody wants to find her on the Whova app, you can. But we do have various sites that are allowed to discharge large volumes of wastewater. So this might be facilities that are treating water or they're producing sort of by, this byproduct water and they're going to put that back into the groundwater. So of 91 sites that have been looked at, about just under 30% have not detected PFAS, whereas that should be 73%. That's my bad for getting those numbers a little off. Those presented percentages don't match up exactly. But the other proportion of those have detected PFAS, and about half of those that have detected PFAS are above our MCLs or AGQS. Outside of those larger facilities, we do have smaller ones that have non-domestic wastewater, so that's not your typical septage or someone flushing something down the toilet. But we do have these other sites where we're realizing they may be sources of PFAS to groundwater. And one of those examples is something that my, con or my colleague Jennifer Harfman is collecting data on, and that is actually PFAS and floor stripping wastewater. So when we think about schools, when we think about medical offices or facilities, or when we think about places that have treated floors that don't want to scuff, they don't want maybe blood stains or food stains, they want them to be durable, they're probably treated with some sort of PFAS product. And as those are washed, stripped, and maintained, what do we actually do with that wastewater? Where does that go? And could this actually be a source of PFAS back into groundwater and causing impacts maybe to nearby wells. So again, this is thinking about some of these smaller sources and how can we identify these and maybe how can we help them just change practices to reduce the amount of PFAS that's getting back into the environment. So again, I recommend you contact Jen Harfman. She loves getting a lot of emails at once. So if everyone could just, even just send her an email to say hello today and just ask her about her data, she would really appreciate that. Now, moving away from groundwater issues, right, we want to start thinking about other things with PFAS. You know, a lot of the national attention right now is on drinking water, drinking water regulation, discovering PFAS in drinking water. But as was discussed yesterday, we know PFAS are also present in fish, shellfish, other biota. We're going to learn more about that in today's presentations as well. And essentially, if you test for PFAS, you're going to find PFAS. It is pretty common in the environment. We know that certain forms are very bioaccumulative in local fish and game. And for a lot of states, our testing and our monitoring efforts are really focused on local responses or where we know that we have distinct sources present. And one of those examples for New Hampshire kind of takes us back to that AFFF site that I first mentioned um, out at the Pease International Trade Port. So the Pease Trade Port is on a peninsula. So imagine a peninsula that's elevated and you have a runway where they are applying AFFF. 
it sort of makes sense. It's going to either go down into the groundwater or it's going to run off into the surrounding estuary. Now, as a part of their initial investigation under the Air Force for the remedial investigation and some of the cleanup activities, they actually went out and did some sampling of shellfish and they detected low levels of most PFAS and shellfish that were not triggering concern based on the EPA screening levels and even the state's lower screening levels. But there was one quirky example and that was perfluoropentanoic acid, a short chain carboxylic acid that was orders of magnitude higher than all the other PFAS and it was present in all the shellfish samples. So this got our attention because it didn't quite make sense because for most of us that have been looking at PFAS, we've sort of learned this theory that short chain shouldn't be as accumulative and shellfish don't seem to accumulate PFAS as much as finfish do. So that seemed a little odd to us, but it was also very concerning to communities because a lot of folks were asking, is it safe to go out and recreationally harvest shellfish? We had a lot of newspaper articles that came out from local press there that were really focused on this high level of PFAS, not specific which one, but a high level of PFAS was found in shellfish and that was concerning. And we also have a lot of shellfish farmers in the state that were asking, does this mean we should be worried about the oyster beds and what we're growing out further away from the peninsula in the bay? What does this mean? So there was a lot of concern. We wanna to try to figure out what that meant so as a state agency, right, we can begin with trying to ask this question, how will we understand the complex chemical behavior in the Great Bay Estuary? It's a massive system, it's intertidal, there's all these other inputs. So option one was trying to reinvent the wheel here and ground up, try to identify how we would design a study, what do we need to know about the system? Option two was look for a terrific partner. Um, this is Dr. Celia Chen from Dartmouth College. She uh, helped run the Toxic Metal Superfund program up there. And a lot of Celia's excellent work has previously been on the fate of mercury and methylmercury in estuary systems, specifically the Great Bay. So we turned to her and her team and asked, hey, if we combine our state's expertise on PFAS, with your expertise on fate and transport and how chemicals work and how the biology and ecology of the system works, can you help us understand what's going on? And Celia said, sure, very enthusiastically. If any of you have ever met Celia Chen, you can probably imagine how enthusiastically she said, sure. So we actually went out, we did some sampling together. Um, this is a great tip for anyone, whether you are in industry, government, academia, get outside with each other and go do sampling projects. They are fun, they are dirty, they are messy. There is nothing better than commiserating about horse flies together. But we actually went out to several sites, we did sampling, we got to learn a lot about some of these sites. This one was actually at the discharge point of a wastewater plant, so we're hoping most of this was sediment. But we actually got to go out and talk to some of these managers and talk to some of the communities and talk to some harvesters and other growers of shellfish as we went out to different sites to understand what their concerns were, and what questions we could be better answering with this research. So just looking at this, you can see the highlighted red area on that map is the former Pease base. And then we had a number of sampling sites that we looked at from around the Great Bay, just trying to see as you get away from the base, as you go out more towards the coast, what happens to the concentrations. And as the graph over here is sort of colorful and messy, but it's essentially showing that the profiles or the color patterns of water and sediment don't necessarily line up. And then the color patterns of what we see in the biota, different kinds of shellfish, including oysters, soft shell clams, razor clams, a whole variety of other bivalves, right? These don't exactly match up. So we're seeing differences in distribution and accumulation. So this is a lot of preliminary data that Celia's group is working up right now. But again, when we looked in the shellfish, we found these pretty low levels and it wasn't as high and we didn't even detect the PFPEA that we were initially looking for in the biota, even though we did find it in the water and some in the sediment. So this is something that we're still looking into. 
We're trying to evaluate what this actually means as far as, you know, are there differences maybe in ecology or in some of the specific sites. We did have that one quirky razor clam that had dramatically higher levels that we were able to sample out at a certain area. So we're still trying to figure out maybe that has to do either with feeding behavior or possibly just the biology of razor clams compared to other bivalves. Now we've actually built on this work in this partnership and we're recently funded by um, CERTUPS, the Department of Defense, to go from just doing occurrence data to trying to understand bioaccumulation. Because for regulators, bioaccumulation is really important so we can start understanding what do surface water and sediment concentrations mean for a whole slew of biota. So we've actually going to be going out this summer, continuing, continuing some sampling and looking at a variety of sites across the Great Bay and the coast of New Hampshire, not only looking at the say triple F site, but if you look at this map, you'll see sites 10, 2, 9, 8, not necessarily numbered in the best order, but these are all further up on tributary rivers. And actually a lot of those are picked because those are where the outfalls are for wastewater plants. Because we're trying to understand are PFAS coming from wastewater plants distinct from what we see at military bases, or when you have an intertidal system like this, does the water change over and movement and fate and transport just sort of blend everything to the point that it's hard to tell them apart. So we're really looking forward to getting some of this data. Hopefully in 2024, we might be coming back or I can be sending some of the students that are working on this project to this conference. And they can present some of our work from the estuary. But what about that PFPEA and the shellfish coming back to that? Well, we actually reached out to EPA Office of Research and Development. We explained that we we're doing this complex project with shellfish and we couldn't figure out why PFPEA was showing up. And it turns out this was an interference. There is a natural compound inside of various shellfish, especially in oysters apparently, that can create a false signal if you're using low resolution equipment and look like PFPEA. So we were able to work with this different group, collect different kinds of samples from different time points to compare this. And this was recently published in Chemosphere. So if anyone wants, there is a link to it but it talks about this issue of interference with short chain PFAS and how that might affect various sampling of things like biota or food products. So again, it's just trying to find these different ways that we can use samples, we can better understand what we're doing and improve confidence. So for us, it was reassuring to understand that this was an interference and try to go back and explain that. But again, too, this is where a lot of folks jumped the gun when they initially saw that high result and were really concerned about this very high level. They were immediately acting on that with sort of news stories and a lot of people have some quotes out there that are maybe regrettable now. And in some ways it's made challenges for us because we do now have shellfish growers that are sort of once bitten twice shy where they're not very confident in some of the work that's being done around PFAS or some of these emerging contaminants, especially if it's gonna threaten their livelihoods and there's questions about the data quality. So it's just something to be mindful about is when we're going out and doing that, letting people know, you know, information might change, we're trying to do the best we can and really just be thoughtful about what we're putting out there. Now, the same team has actually expanded from the coast inland. We're basically a marching army that is invading and sampling wherever we can. But in 2020, 2021, my agency issued some fish consumption advisories for some freshwater lakes in Southern New Hampshire and the same team was now curious, could we do some of these bioaccumulation studies in freshwater systems? So Celia's team up at Dartmouth, along with a lot of the other entities listed here, have had some experience either looking at PFAS or looking at mercury fate and transport. And we're trying to see if we can apply those lessons from legacy compounds to emerging contaminants and trying to understand how do things like particulate matter, phytoplankton, surface water partitioning, really affect the fate and transport in these food webs. So we're really looking forward to getting this work started. It's gonna be a very busy season going from the coast inland. I'm really, really let down. I'm gonna to have to spend a lot of time out there shell fishing and fishing this summer. But we also wanna be mindful that there are some other groups in our state that have unique biological resources and that we've also partnered with. So the Loon Preservation Committee is an entity in our state that protects this charismatic species, loons. And they do so by a combination of you know, research and advocacy, but one of the unique resources they have is a massive collection 
of unhatched loon eggs. So these are all eggs that have failed to hatch. They're not going out and killing baby loons, but they collect these unhatched eggs, preserve them, and we're actually gonna support them by paying for the analysis of over hundred eggs. So we can look at a multitude of lakes and understand which lakes do we have really high levels of PFAS showing up in our loons because that may indicate to us hot spot lakes where there is a large amount of bioaccumulation occurring because loons actually have some unique ecology where they forage very close to the lakes that they nest on. So they're almost very, very focused there. So it's not like if you have a loon in one spot, it's foraging over a 20 mile radius. They're really localized to where they live. So we're hoping to actually take advantage of this and this unique resource because their previous work on loon eggs has actually shown very, very high levels of PFOS and other PFAS are present in some of these eggs. And they're almost close to sort of competing in the top, I'd say top 10 for some of the highest concentrations we've seen in bird eggs in the literature. So again, this is a unique opportunity where a lot of this didn't stem from PFAS work. It stemmed from us talking with these organizations about other contaminants like PCBs and finding this unique connection. Now, getting away from things that are wet and slippery, we start thinking more about soil impacts. Um, from a regulatory perspective, we are looking at proposing the soil standards in this summer. And oftentimes for a lot of entities, those are based on contact or sort of these general considerations, but one of the things we need to think about now is how are PFAS different from other contaminants? You know, given how EPA is looking at toxicity of these, should we really be focusing more on just that exposure? Or like what we're learning from other states that are finding this in agricultural sources, do we need to be looking at agricultural impacts and impacts to various things that are grown in the soil? What we do know is we actually have generated some of the data for a statewide soil map um, we did this in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, anyone that's interested in some of that data, we have a link there. I'm very interested to listen to Lisa Camp's um, presentation later today about soils in Massachusetts. But again, it's getting an understanding of where these occur. And I'll sort of give everyone the quick highlight of that is we detect these everywhere. We, out of 100 sites that we tested across the state, we did not find soils that do not have PFAS in them. So again, these are very widespread contaminants and that really affects how we think about addressing them. So there's a lot of other ways that this could be impacting people. We start thinking about things like gardening use, but also biosolids. So in New Hampshire, we do have a sort of testing requirement for biosolids to see just sort of screening them of how much PFAS is in there. Um, in general, the levels that we've seen in our state are lower than in other states, especially for example, like Maine, where there is unique application previously of certain materials into their biosolids that create a unique scenario there. But again, this does raise concerns about waste management, how wastewater facilities are going to basically dispose of these materials. This is raising really important economic questions for towns and municipalities. So we've also tried to focus on source prevention by using some of the screening to identify where folks possibly taking in, you know, specific sources from either industrial places or other spots that could be causing elevations of PFAS inside of compost or other biosolid material. Now, one of the things we're trying to do right now, and I'm hoping to be able to present on this next year, is we're actually doing a greenhouse study. We actually have everything out for analysis right now. We're just waiting on the lab to send us the results. But we decided to take advantage of our state's firefighting academy. We've collected some water from the fire academy and used that to grow vegetables that were in a mixture of different soils from across the state and different applications of biosolids from a sort of typical community biosolid producer. Basically trying to ask this question of, you know, does the use of contaminated water or the combination with biosolids, does that impact the uptake of PFAS into certain plants? So we we're able to take advantage of this. Um, our fire academy was very enthusiastic about participating. That is a picture right there of our pickup truck out in front of the academy and us pumping water from one of the wells. And that is my boss's seven year old son holding the hose there. So he has gloves on, we had protective gear for him, but he really wanted to go out that day in the truck with us and see what we were doing. So we actually did this in partnership with the local community college. They had recently set up a hoop house that they were allowed to use for um, gardening experiments. 
And this is one of the ways we're trying to provide some support outside of the larger institutions in the state, some more local colleges. That way folks that are going there could have the opportunity to participate and we're able to bring in some students to that project. Now to sort of piggyback on that was we had another unique opportunity come along and that same summer back in 2022, a local town identified that their fire department had caused a groundwater plume of PFAS that had affected several homes and the plume had actually moved under and through the town's community garden and had impacted their irrigation system. So we reached out to the town and they were incredibly gracious and allowed us to sample from their garden, their soil, their compost, the water, and some of the vegetables there, which from a research perspective makes sense. Why not do this? But again, this is sort of a risk communication thing of we're asking them to test for something that we're not requiring anyone else to test for. And they're gonna have to deal with whatever those results are even though a town over may have worst results, but will never test for something. So this took a lot of trust and we're really appreciative that they're willing to let us do this. We're trying to work very closely with them on communication about this. So we sent the samples out for analysis. We're still waiting on the vegetable results to come in because right now the lab is backlogged. So if anyone's familiar with SGS Access, they're very popular. They're also very popular to the point that they're kind of running behind right now on some samples. But when we look at things like garden soil, compost, and irrigation water, again, we kind of see some different profiles. But one of the things that's interesting here is, you know, the garden soil isn't really outside the range of what we've seen across the state, even in areas without impacted water supplies. But when we look at the irrigation water, this is sort of typical for some of the AFFF areas that we've seen where we have sort of in the hundreds range for parts per trillion of water. But this middle one is what's the most interesting because this is compost that they were using. This is supposedly all organic natural compost being applied to this garden. This is not biosolids. And we have detectable levels of PFAS. We actually have a mixture of different ones that we could find using the analyte list. And if we actually go to that composters website you know they list things that are considered safe and organic for inclusion into their compost such as muffin wrappers and broken down pizza boxes and several other things that i'm sure people have used as pictures on their introductions of pfas slides so again this is something that yes we detected it because we tested for it but what do we do next about it because one of the questions that we have from this community now is, well, if this compost has PFAS in it, where do we get compost that's PFAS free? And the answer is we don't know because compost like this, especially if it has yard waste or other materials, isn't regulated in our state. That may vary from state to state. And again, a lot of these materials that are being thrown in there, are like even yard waste bags, right? They're probably treated with some degree of PFAS. Now, a lot of this is meaningless if we don't get out and communicate with our communities, our populace, our stakeholders. So one of the things that we always try to focus on is risk communication and how do we get out to people? You know, our classic approach has been these town halls where we get up on the stage, we tell people what we know, and then they take turns going up to the microphone and asking us questions or letting us have it in some cases. But What's been great and kind of ironic about 2020 is, you know, we've learned that other approaches might work better and maybe more remote approaches. And that's just one of the things I want to emphasize here is, you know, maybe fact sheets work for some communities, maybe recorded videos work for other ones that you can put on YouTube and watch later. Or alternatively, one of the things that we found was really helpful in a community where tensions were really high around PFAS was we held a PFAS fair where we brought in different people had different table stations set up from all the different programs we had people from epa cdc local universities legislatures the different state agencies different programs from the state agencies all there to answer people's questions and they could go around ask their questions if you weren't at the right table we'd help direct you to the right person that could answer those providing information and that really made a difference in the community's trust for us, but it also really helped some of our partners, both at the federal level and at academic institutions, understand what our needs were at the state level for this challenge. 
So you know, always be willing to try new approaches. And I also want to give a plug to other groups that are out there too, working on risk communication. Um, I help out with this team. This is the Interstate Technology Regulatory Council. They do a lot of great work with risk communication trainings. If any of you are unfamiliar with risk communication or want to learn more about it, I recommend this toolkit. If any of you are looking for a great way to get involved and improve risk communication methods, you can actually join these teams and contribute and learn yourself. So I'd like to give that shout out. And then finally, we have an awesome website that finally got redesigned. It looks like a website that was meant to be in this decade. Uh, we have a lot of information on there, a lot of documents, um, points of contacts related to PFAS, and then we even have our general website that provides other information about environmental contaminants. So sort of take home messages for this are, you know, leveraging resources makes a difference. Having $6 million is great, but figuring out ways to make it go longer and make it more effective really matter. Seek partnerships that'll move you beyond a current studies, right? With PFAS, we're really kind of stuck at this stage of we test for it, we find it, and we're alarmed, but how do we start taking it to those next levels of getting the information we need to be more actionable and sort of break the chain on how it's moving the environment? Also think about, talk with, not about the people and potential partners. You know, Try to have those conversations, whether it's connecting by Zoom, it's grabbing people at coffee breaks at this conference, or if it's just setting up impromptu meetings with various partners in the state that normally you wouldn't think of working with and seeing how you can help each other. And finally, mentorship from different sectors is really important because all of us here today are probably going to retire before the issue of PFAS and emerging contaminants is resolved. So it's really important that we have opportunities like this conference for people from different sectors to meet, discuss, share thoughts and perspectives so we can plan to help each other down the road. So with that, I think I have enough time for questions. There's my contact information. And thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Jonathan. That was wonderful. Um, the sheer variety and volume of work that you guys are doing for a state your size is pretty incredible. Um, we do have time for questions. If there's any questions from the audience or if anybody has questions online, um, you can submit them through Whova and we will ask them for you. Questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. The uh, MCL established by New Hampshire at 0 0.07 part per billion. How is that number? How did we come to that number? How is that determined? So New Hampshire's MCL for PFOA is 12 parts per trillion. The 0 0.07 parts per billion, I believe, is the EPA's former health advisory. That is not our MCL. So our MCL for PFOA is 12 parts per trillion, for PFOS is 15 parts per trillion, and then for PFHXS and PFNA, it is 18 and 11 parts per trillion, respectively. Got so it. we're down Excellent. on the, yeah, we're down the low double digits for our MCLs and for those four compounds. Um, we do have the ability to take finalized EPA health advisories and adopt them as our groundwater standards, which in some ways function kind of like an MCL within the state. Um, not necessarily, it's sort of regulatory tricky, but when we look at like the, you know, 2000 parts per trillion for PFBS or even the 10 parts per trillion for Gen X that EPA finalized over this last summer, when we actually start looking across all of our data that we have for the not just private wells, groundwater monitoring, other sites, we don't find any sites that those would trigger action for. So it's sort of interesting because those are more contaminants that are an issue for some other states because of industrial practices, but they're not parts of the PFAS family that are really triggering or driving action here in New Hampshire. Thanks, we do have some questions from Whova that we'll ask as well. So uh, online from Whova, why are compost procedures listed as possible PFAS sources? Yeah, so with compost, right, a lot of times folks think about like backyard composting and it's just food scraps going in and what could be wrong, but 
there's a lot of compostable food packaging that is listed as you can throw it in your compost bin or at larger facilities like a town composting heap. If it's like food related material, that food packaging, you could either have PFAS added to the food packaging, which is what we hit typically think of when we think of, okay, that could be a source into compost is you have a compostable food bowl for whatever fast food chain you're thinking of. They add PFAS to make it durable. And when that breaks down, the PFAS that was added goes into the compost. So that's one source. But for example, if you have something that's labeled as no PFAS added, and it's a recycled food bowl, they may not have added PFAS, but if the original material, the original like paper product material that was used to make that previously had PFAS in its last life, that could still be transferred into this. And arguably the person or the entity selling you that food container can still say it's PFAS free or no PFAS was added because they didn't add it in making their product, but if the feedstock was already contaminated, that could be a source. And if that ultimately ends up in composting, that's a problem. And you know, up here in New Hampshire, we have a lot of yard waste composting that goes on. A lot of those yard waste bags, right? They are designed to withstand having wet leaves and being left out on the street corner in the rain. A lot of those may also contain PFAS in them as well. And when that gets sent to a compost pile, all kinds of stuff get blended in, especially at like these larger town scale compost heaps. So we started starting to recognize, you know, some of those, depending on what's being added and what kind of compost it is, very well could be another source of PFAS, especially if you have very large piles forming that could be leaching into the ground. Another one from online. How quickly will New Hampshire be able to adopt the US EPA PFAS standards? Do you foresee any constraints with adopting these numbers? So I am not a regulatory lawyer, um, but in theory, we should be able to adopt them as quickly as other states do. But it also sort of depends on how EPA writes their own rules. So for example, if EPA says their MCL does not take effect for a public water system until they have completed sampling from 2024 through 2026. Well, New Hampshire's public water systems have already been sampling since 2020 annually or quarterly in some cases. So a lot of this, we already have the data and that is one of the concerns of, you know, is the proposed rule that EPA put forward is it being mindful of states that have already completed monitoring or is it written in a way where it's going to cause that kind of confusion? Um, you know, in several cases, we actually have a rule that allows us every year to go and evaluate the science, regulatory information, other considerations to see if it needs to be revised and moved downward. Um, it's just a question of if EPA, when they're able to get it through the final rulemaking process and what that looks like. So we could probably move pretty quickly on that, but again, it'll just depend on if EPA's rule is written in a way where it still allows states to sort of move accordingly based on their own information. Great, we have a couple more questions on Whova, but I wanted to check and see if there were any other questions in the room first. Okay, Beth, go ahead. How are you able to gain trust with the community garden? Did it require long-term partners or champions or something else? So it was a little bit of us being fully transparent on what we know and what we don't know which can be really uncomfortable, especially for someone with acronyms after their name like me, right? The idea of going in and telling people, we don't know the following things and it could get messy, right? That doesn't, it initially doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, but being transparent about the knowns and the unknowns and what some of the risks are is usually really appreciated um, because as many of you know, if you 
talk to people, especially folks that are maybe in town governments or in sort of positions of authority. Sometimes they have a really good sense when someone is BSing them or uh, sort of fibbing. So if you paint too cheery of a picture and sort of downplay the risk or uncertainties, it can make them more uncomfortable. Um, so the first thing was just being really transparent of, we don't know, we know we're probably gonna detect something, but this is a unique opportunity for us to get that information and to really help out. The other side of this was having those champions. And in this case, the town administrator and the town community event coordinator who runs the garden, they realized that the town is the responsible party in this case for the contamination with firefighting foam. Um, I realize there's a broader discussion about, but who actually made the firefighting foam, so on and so forth. Until all those discussions are settled in various courts, like right now, the town is the one that owns the firefighting department and the firefighting department caused this issue. Um, we're really lucky that in this case, they are very focused on being proactive about PFAS and protecting health and trying to understand what's going on. So they appreciated that we came to them and wanted to give them this opportunity. It was a unique time where we could use the funding this way and they were willing to take that chance with us. But again, it's also, we've been routinely communicating the, with them on when we know things, what we're finding out, and also letting them know about the uncertainties. That way they know where we are in this process. Our last question from online. Uh, the author thanks you for the soil study plug. And then the question is, has NHDES reviewed the FDA analytical method for analysis of food products to minimize potential confounders because food items are so complex? So DES has not because ultimately we do not have a food analyze analysis lab. Um, we did look at some of that when we were looking at the shellfish data um, and trying to sort out what was going on there. Um, our food safety lab in the state wants to start doing some PFAS work. However, because of how complicated it is, we've sort of shied away from establishing that capacity, um, not to mention that it's almost half a million dollars to get a piece of equipment to do that. Um, so we are aware that FDA has had similar issues, especially with PFPEA, because I don't know if folks remember a few years back, there were also some news articles about chocolate cake causes cancer because they detected a certain PFAS in chocolate cake mix. It was PFPEA. And when they went back and looked at the method later on, they found out it was an interference again. Um, so we are aware that they sort of had a similar issue with that um, not the same interferent, but PFPEA being detected and that when they went back and looked at more high resolution methods, it went away. So we are aware of that, but again, too, that's where it gets tricky because some of the FDA work hasn't really focused as much on like wildlife and game as our work has. Okay, great. Jonathan, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I, we appreciate you being here and uh, especially given the, um, the health challenges you're facing, taking the time this morning to be here uh, is very appreciated. Thank you. It's great, no, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to have like five halls all at once before I got on here. 